Um, we do have now have a, a special video message from uh, Lisa Jackson, the National Administrator of the EPA, who uh, would like to have been here, but uh, sent us uh, this kind message right now. So if you'll uh, look at, toward the screen, and I'll say roll tape. Do we still have tape these days? Um, roll video. Oh, I'm EPA Administrator Lisa P. Jackson. I'm sorry I couldn't be with you in person for the 2012 Waterfront Conference, but I wanted to show my support for the work you're doing. I started my career and spent many years living in New York and New Jersey, but it was my hometown of New Orleans where I first saw the connection between local waters and the health, the economy, and the culture of my community. That deep connection was something I recognized in my time working in your communities. I have a great love for the waterfronts you protect, and I'm grateful to know they're in such good hands today. This year, we celebrate the 40th anniversary of the National Clean Water Act and look forward to efforts like yours as part of the ongoing progress of that law. We know that clean, vibrant waterfronts can be centerpieces of community strength and economic growth, and the work you're doing is something we've made a priority for urban waters across America. That's why the EPA spearheaded the formation of an Urban Waters Federal Partnership with 10 other federal agencies. We want to put our expertise and resources to work in ways that will tap the vast environmental and economic potential of urban waterfronts. We will continue to look to the Metropolitan Waterfront Alliance as a leader in successful waterfront protection and restoration, and follow your work as a model for success in other communities. Thank you again for all that you do, and I hope you have a productive and enjoyable conference. And we will, Ms. Jackson. We will. Um, so many of us are sometimes witness to history. Some of us are participants in history, and it's my uh, privilege uh, to uh, introduce uh, Chuck Warren, who was a former EPA administrator for our region, now serves as a, the head of the environmental practice at Kramer Naftalis, Frank, and uh, I'm sorry, Kramer 11, Kramer 11, I'll say <laughs> shorthand. Um, and uh, more importantly, was working for Senator Jacob Javits back when the Clean Water Act was passed in 1972. I think he was probably one of the part of their special Cub Scout brigade that they had in the office centers. But uh, ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Chuck Warren to tell us a little bit about the history and present and perhaps future of the Clean Water Act. At least the Boy Scouts were all there. I think it's hard to, as we get to the 40th anniversary of the Clean Water Act, I think it's really hard to look back on it without putting it in historical context. Uh, and after the uh, Industrial Revolution that uh, came uh, from the Civil War, as I think most of you know, we had a period of about 100 years where we had basically industries uh, sprouting all over the country and, base, and being located on waterways. And what do those industries do? They dump their pollutants into the rivers, lakes, uh, and coastal areas, and there was absolutely no control. What did the government do about that? Not much. The first regulatory, federal regulatory program, and the Colonel gives me an opportunity to recognize him, uh, was the 1899 Rivers and Harbors Act, where it gave the Corps of Engineers regulatory authority over structures in the navigable waters and over dumping things in navigable waters. That was the first program, and it remained really the only federal regulatory program uh, for many, many years. Next, you had the 1948 Federal Water Pollution Control Act, and that was a fairly modest thing, and what it did was provided some federal funds for water quality uh, surveys, and it started the first construction of treatment plants on a fairly modest level. You had some sort of minor amendments back and forth, but really nothing happened until we get to what I call the environmental revolution of the early 1970s. And I think that really came about because of a confluence of circumstances. Uh, first, you had really a flowering of uh, environmental consciousness in the country that uh, probably started uh, with Rachel Carson's Silent Spring in 1967, and you really had this reach its, I think, apogee in the, in the early 1970s, where you had the public after Earth Day uh, really clamoring for environmental protection in a whole number of areas. 
And uh, there were a lot of studies that were done really in, like in, in 1968 that showed the Chesapeake Bay fisheries were losing millions of dollars every year because of pollution. In 1969, they did bacteria studies in the Hudson River and showed that uh, bacteria counts were 170 times what the normal bacteria counts should be. Uh, there were fish kills at record numbers in 1969. And in the most famous incident that everybody seems to remember, in the Cuyahoga River that actually caught fire uh, because of all the oil and other kinds of pollutants that were there. As a result of that, Congress was stirred to action. And in 1971, a senator from Maine by the name of Edmund Muskie in introduced amendments uh, to the Federal Water Pollution Control Act. And those amendments became the Clean Water Act of 1972. And to my mind, it's sort of an interesting historical note how Muskie got involved in all of this. And it really goes back to Lyndon Johnson, whom we don't normally associate with uh, pollution efforts or environmental efforts. Uh, when Lyndon Johnson was the majority leader in the Senate in the 1950s, Edmund Muskie was elected from Maine as the senator. And he was a pretty independent kind of guy. And Johnson came to him one day and said, I need your vote on this particular bill. And he said, I'm sorry, Mr. Leader, I, I just can't do it because I, I don't agree with what the bill's trying to do. Johnson, uh, as was his want, did not take this kindly. And he said, well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to send uh, Muskie to Siberia in the Senate, which was the Senate Public Works Committee. And in those days, that was considered a, a post in the middle of nowhere and did doing nothing. But out of that came the creation of the Environmental Pollution Subcommittee, headed by Edmund Muskie. And out of that came a series of landmark environmental legislation, starting with the Clean Air Act of 1970. So when we got to 1972, uh, this, the, Clean Air Act was put, the Clean Water Act was put together by Muskie and his people, and also working with the House members and both sides. And I think the interesting thing to remember is that this was a time of rare bipartisan action, and I'll talk about that more in a minute, which looks very strange when you juxtapose it with what's going on in Washington today. So they came out with this bill in 1972, passed overwhelmingly, but on October 17th, President Nixon vetoed the bill. A lot of people don't remember that. And you know, Nixon was not one of my favorites, but he did have a, a pretty decent environmental record. Uh, you know, he signed the Clean Air Act in 1970. He established the Federal Environmental Protection Agency in, in the December of 1970. But he vetoed the Clean Water Act. And the reason he did it was he said it would spend $24 billion of the taxpayers' money. And he thought that was way too much. And $18 billion of that was on the construction grants program. Now, the, the Senate immediately took up the veto the same day, October 17th, and they overrode the veto 52 to 12, overwhelmingly. And the people who, showed, who didn't show up to vote were probably afraid to vote no, so they just didn't show up. And it went to the House the next day and was overridden 247 to 23. And when, when's the last time you saw those kinds of majorities? Again, a number of members not showing up. Uh, because they didn't want to be recorded against it. So there was overwhelming sentiment in the country and in the Congress for the Clean Water Act. And what did it do that was really revolutionary? First, it built on the construction grant program to provide up to 75% of the cost of water pollution control facilities for municipalities all over the country. And I think, as we know, that's helped really clean up waters everywhere. It also talked about putting some teeth in water quality standards and having EPA review the state setting of water quality standards. It, for the first time, uh, had a permit program that dealt with industrial pollution by the smooth name of the National Pollutant Discharge Elimination System permit. And uh, that really set up the first permitting program that regulated uh, industrial pollution going into water bodies. Um, it set the, up the 404 program, which really built on the Rivers and Harbors Act of 1899, where the Corps of Engineers has the primary jurisdiction, but EPA has review jurisdiction over that, and that, that deals with uh, wetlands and 
placing fill in navigable waters. And what it did was it expanded the Federal Water Pollution Control Act, which really had dealt mostly with interstate waters, to the concept of waters of the United States or navigable waters. And it covered a great many things, and that's been the subject of a lot of uh, litigation and court cases as to how wide the reach of navigable waters is. Um, it also uh, looked at pretreatment programs for industry for the first time and set that up. And it was really, it was really a revolutionary uh, act in every way. And I think as we look 40 years down the road as to what's happened, there's been tremendous progress. I know when I was, uh, first became regional administrator in Region 2, the beginning of 1980, I had a meeting with my staff, and one of the problems that they talked about, they said, you know, there's a billion gallons, one billion gallons of raw sewage going into the Hudson River every day. So I said, well, what do we have to do to stop it? They said, well, the first thing you might have to do is to stop all development on the west side of Manhattan. I said, uh, what's my second choice? Um, so what we did was we started the process of building two major sewage treatment plants, the North River Sewage Treatment Plant and the Red Hook Sewage Treatment Plant, that give us the capacity of almost 400 million gallons a day of treatment, and then went to the New Jersey uh, people and said, you have to get secondary treatment in all of that, uh, in, in all of your plants that are along the Hudson and that dump into the Hudson. And I think as a result, 40 years later, we're seeing a tremendously cleaner Hudson, and seeing so clean to the point that the marine wood borers have come back, I think, in force, and the piers are now getting a little shaky, as probably Madeline has a problem from, uh, and as Steve Zahn can probably tell you too, from DEC. Um, but I think that. The Clean Water Act is really one of the major success stories of the environmental revolution of the early 1970s. Are there still things to be done? You bet. I think there still are areas that don't really have secondary treatment and, are re and aren't dealing with their discharges in an appropriate way. Um, as we know here, combined sewer overflows, and Carter Strickland has to deal with that in a major way in New York City. That's a, that's a very important problem. That's a big problem that needs to be dealt with in so many urban areas all around the country. Non-point source pollution, still something that hasn't been dealt with effectively, whether it comes from farms, uh, roadways, or things like that, we still haven't gotten a handle on that. We're still losing wetlands at an unprecedented uh, level, and there, there's more that can be done. But I really think as I look back on the Clean Water Act and that time that it was an extraordinary time, it was an extraordinary act, and it's something that I think is going to be difficult to duplicate as we go ahead in the future unless we get to the point where there's a renewed consciousness of environmental issues and environmental problems. And I don't, in, in bad economic times, it's always difficult to do that. I'm hopeful we'll see that again. But I think uh, I felt that I was lucky to be involved in that revolution, and I think we're still seeing the fruits of that today. And I know all of you in this room are working in various ways to continue that legacy, and I think we all appreciate what you're doing. Thanks very much. I'll just, uh, just echo the. Uh, when Chuck told me that story of the overriding of that uh, of the veto, it was almost like a pigs can fly story. I couldn't believe there was bipartisan support. And I just want to say that we in the environmental movement uh, sometimes talk really well to ourselves. The important thing is to talk to others, and that's what the MWA is about: is to expand our reach to non-likely suspects, to bridge gaps that don't need to exist, to try and preach the gospel to everybody, to get to a point, again, where we can all agree enough that we could uh, have that kind of movement that uh, resulted in the Clean Water Act. Okay, now moving on to uh, uh, our, our keynote speaker. We, to introduce our keynote speaker, I'm very pleased uh, to introduce Bob Stilwell. Uh, one year ago, we, uh, a little over one year, we had the Comprehensive Waterfront Plan was announced, which I think was an extremely progressive new program that many of you helped to put together with the City of New York. Uh, we're going to hear uh, uh, an update on that. 
uh, and also an introduction of our keynote speaker, John Boulay. So please welcome the Deputy Mayor for Economic Development and also the Chairman of the Waterfront Management Advisory Board, Bob Steele. Great. Well, thank you, Roland. It's really a privilege to be here on behalf of Mayor Bloomberg and his, his administration. Uh, what I thought I would do, and Roland was nice enough to invite me to do, is to really do two things. First of all, spend a few minutes uh, bringing you up to date on what we've done and are focused on in the administration to think about the waterfront. And then secondly, have the special privilege of introducing the speaker, uh, who will be really, I think, telling us lots of interesting things about what's going on. Um, I think first, though, let me begin by congratulating Roland and chairman of uh, the organization, Metropolitan Waterfront Alliance, John Watts, for all they've done, uh, both on behalf of the organization, but also really for all of us who live and care so much about New York City. Uh, it's great to be here today, and this conference is just one more manifestation of all the great work they're doing and how much is being done on behalf of all of us. So we really want to say thank you to all of them. Uh, I think also, too, that this theme that Roland and John are putting forward every day of speaking about the waterfront is something also that resonates with Mayor Bloomberg and is something he speaks to us a great deal all about at City Hall. Uh, just last March, Mayor Bloomberg and Speaker Quinn announced the release of the Waterfront Vision and Enhancement Strategy, or WAVES as we called it then. And WAVES is really a two-part plan. There's both longer-term perspectives or themes, and then also the nitty-gritty of how do you get it done. A and that really was the, the idea that Mayor Bloomberg would insist upon. You know, we just all have to refresh our minds that we have about 520 miles of waterfront exposure here in New York City. A and just to put that in perspective, I always like to tell people that's like Chicago, San Francisco, Seattle, and Portland all combined. So that's really the scale and scope of what we're talking about that we're the stewards for taking care of and making sure that it's activated in all the right way and also balancing the interests of commercial, residential, and recreation. Uh, ways we're committed to building on the historic track record that Mayor Bloomberg has tried to establish with regard to bringing back the waterfront after a long period of neglect and disinvestment. During this administration, 400 acres of new waterfront parks have been acquired and 20 miles of waterfront park greenways have all been, have been built. Madeline spoke just a few minutes ago to you about her exciting vision for the park in which we stand today, and I really think that's just another example in her great leadership of what we're trying to do to keep this on the front of mind, both the administration and also for all of the public. These are challenging assets to be responsible for, but we're committed to doing everything we can. But it isn't just about parks and about access to the waterfront for, re for recreational aspects. It also connects to housing where we have more than 16,000 new housing units that have been built near the waterfront to th since 2002, which is more than double the amount for the previous 10 years. That means more and more New Yorkers are becoming connected with the waterfront in terms of how they live. This increasing connectivity to the water has been facilitated by a significant improvement in the water quality, which was just mentioned. Since 2002, more than $9 billion has been invested in order to improve the quality of the water in our harbor. As a result, waterways are the healthiest they've been in more than a century. By at least one important measure, New York City waterways are 99% cleaner than they were in just in the 1970s. So as I said, WAVES has two components, a longer term thematic perspective and also the getting it done. And some of those long-term themes are ones that let me just take a second and walk through for you, because I think they're worth just kind of refreshing as we consider how to think about all the things we're, we're working and talking about today. We're talking about expanding the public access. We're talking about enlivening the waterfront, recognizing the need to support the working waterfront, as I just iterated and now reiterate, improving the water quality restoring the natural waterfront, enhancing the blue network, recognizing the importance of climate resilience, and also improving governmental up oversight, which is something Rowling continually suggests we can do better on. But we all know that ma the mayor is a leader who demands specifics and accountability, and these themes that I just mentioned aren't enough for him. He's not a themes kind of guy. 
And so I think that as we've laid out the waterfront action agenda, we set forth 125 priority projects that we published and that we want to have implemented by the end of our administration, which is in 595 days, not that we're counting. <laughs> the mayor sets high standards for all of us and we're committed to delivering on these priorities on specific timelines and also providing to all of you who really hold us accountable how we're doing. So today what we're issuing is an update on all of these plans and going through them one by one, giving ourselves a grade on the progress to date. And we think that uh, this is the right place to talk about this, uh, that the NWA is a place that is the right place to hold us accountable. And so we feel comfortable sharing with you, and that's what they're doing today as we're uh, presenting these, and, and there'll be copies for you as you leave. Please, um, hopefully, check this out and let us know how you think we're doing. When we look at the, as I said, 125 specific projects, 34 are already completed, another 71 are on schedule. So we're halfway into the time that we committed to work on these projects, and we have about 84% of them where we're making progress and either done or we're on schedule to have them done as we wish. Unfortunately, that's not a perfect grade, as my boss reminded me. Uh, 14 are delayed. Five we're having to reshape and reconsider. And because we're among friends, we'll admit that one of these we haven't been able to make progress on yet, but we're committed to getting, making that happen in the future. So let me take a second just to highlight for you some of the progress on these 125 that we're pleased about and also tell you what we're committed to doing in the days ahead. First, the Easter for Ferry service was launched last June and in less than a year of service has significantly outperformed the ridership expectations. This is being well managed by EDC, and my colleague Tim Sullivan, who's with me from City Hall, has been the captain of this project. Uh, it's off to a great start. We're just getting going, but I think everything about it suggests we need to think about how to make this a permanent part of the transportation infrastructure of New York City and take it from being a temporary experiment into something we know will be part of our transportation system in the years ahead. In Staten Island, Construction began on a six-acre waterfront esplanade in Stapleton, and the mixed-use development at the former Homeport site has made significant progress with developer agreement having closed and the demolition work completed. So when you stand there, just as we did in a wintry day last winter, and now when you stand there, you can start to see what's going to happen at that site and how it's being brought to life for an exciting new community. At the Brooklyn Navy Yard, the federal government transferred ownership of the Admiral Rose site clearing the way for the creation of 500 industrial and retail jobs. The Brooklyn Navy Yard story is a good one and one we should all be pleased about and try to learn from and to think about what we can do in other places to learn from the success of the Navy Yard. In April, Mayor Bloomberg and Port Authority Executive Director Pat Foy announced the replacement and lowering of the Anchorage Channel tap water si siphons to facilitate the deepening of the harbor shipping channel that's so critical to the future of the maritime industry. We all know what's going on in the Panama Canal and us making the right investments to be consistent and coordinated with that change is what we're trying to do as we plan ahead for the future. We also signed an agreement with the state to invest one and a half billion dollars over the next 18 years for green infrastructure to capture steam water runoff and reduce combined sewer overflow. My colleague, Kaz Holloway, will talk about this in more detail later today. We also completed a study of rib mussel beds in Fresh Creek. Jane's Carousel opened at the top of Brooklyn Bridge Park just a few months ago and is already a highlight for people who are using the park. And Orchard Beach in the Bronx, the beach was replenished with clean sand and the south jetty was expanded to further reduce beach erosion. So you can see as we roll down these types of things that are illustrative of what we're trying to do as we focus on all 125 of these initiatives. But we're not done yet and the scorecard isn't complete. We're focusing on restoration projects, we're focusing on commercial activities, and we're also continually reminded by all of you the importance of public access. And Mayor Bloomberg has made it clear to all of us who work for him that our goal is to sprint to the finish to make sure we make the most of the time that we're privileged to serve during the re remaining part of his administration. 
So thanks to Roland and the NWA for the opportunity to be here today and to describe to you what we're thinking about at City Hall. So now let me shift to my second responsibility, which is to have the privilege of introducing Colonel John Belay of the Army Corps of Engineers. Colonel Belay assumed command of the New York District of the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers in July of 2009. The New York District is responsible for the Corps' water resources development, navigation, and regulatory activities in northeastern New Jersey, east and south central New York State, including the New York Harbor and Long Island, and parts of Vermont, Massachusetts, and Connecticut. That's a big job. Colonel Boulay also holds the title of Supervisor of the New York Harbor, so be nice to him, we're in his harbor today. <laughs> Colonel Boulay graduated in 1986 from the U.S. Military Academy, and after earning two Masters of Science degrees from Stanford University and professional engineer certification, he taught hydrology at the Department of Civil and, Civil and Mechanical Engineer at West Point. Colonel Boulay also served in a variety of operational, command, and staff assignments in the United States and overseas, including assignments in Germany, Operation Desert Storm, Korea, and Iraq. Colonel Boulay's decorations include the Legion of Merit, the Bronze Star Medal, six awards for meritorious service, and the, the Ranger tab and the Combined Action Badge. Please join me in thanking and welcoming Colonel John Boulay. Well, thank you, Mr. Uh, Deputy Mayor. Appreciate the introduction. I'm glad you used the short version of the biography. Um, you know, listen to Chuck, it's great to be part of a glamorous conference where you talk about things like sewage, pollution, and other really sexy topics. Um, you know, and, and Roland, thanks for having me here. I appreciate it. Uh, what do you do when the first 12 people that you ask to be keynote speaker decline? Well, you invite Colonel Boulay to come up and, and, and give your remarks. So, thanks, Roman. It's good to be in the top 15. I appreciate that. Um, <laughs> but uh, at least I'm on the list, you know? And, and as I look around, I see a lot of familiar faces. And, and when you start to look around rooms as an Army officer, and you recognize people and you know their names, it only can mean one thing, and, and that means it's time to PCS and go someplace else. Um, that's the way the Army is. Once you figure out your job, uh, they give you a new one. Uh, so I'll be leaving here in the next few months. And the only reason I mention that is not because my resume is available to anyone, uh, but um, I mention it because um, you can get away with saying some things that uh, early on in your tenure uh, might be a little bit more difficult to get away with. Um, and that's what I intend to do this morning is, is talk a little bit about uh, some of the challenges that I see. You know, it's, it's great to be discussing all the successes we've had as a harbor estuary community, but we have many challenges ahead. You know, I learned a long time ago as a staff officer in the Army, if you're going to talk about the problems you have, you better come in to the meeting or the conference and talk about some solutions to those problems. So I'd like to offer a few solutions also after I've discussed the problems in some detail. You know, this is a great, uh, great theme and, and the MWA once again deserves a lot of credit uh, for putting this conference together. They do a, a top-notch, world-class job. And so I thank, uh, I thank you again, uh, Roland and, and the MWA, for, for having the Corps here. And, and we're happy to be a part of, of the waterfront and water resources here in, in the New York metropolitan area. It's a great theme. It's kind of a juxtaposition of how the harbor was viewed in the past. You heard Mr. Warren talk a little bit about that. Um, you know, pretty much this harbor was an economic engine in the past which was exploited uh, for economic gain with little consideration for the environment. You know, the Corps was part of that inglorious past. Uh, you know, we, one of the first civil works, one of the water re first water resources missions we had was to really clear the East River of hazards to navigation. The East River back in the 19th century used to claim about 50 ships a year. 
uh, due to uh, collisions with rocks and other hazards on the East River. So the Corps was given the mission to clear this out. And uh, we did that pretty much through indiscriminate blasting operations all across the, uh, the East River. The one uh, which is especially noteworthy is one that occurred in 1885 where the Corps conducted a blasting operation to eliminate Flood Rock, which is right at Hell Gate, which is really the entrance to the East River and Long Island Sound, or vice versa, depending on which way the tide's going. We're really under the direction of Colonel John Newton. The Corps detonated 280,000 pounds of explosives, uh, generally simultaneously at one time. Which was interesting about this, we, by the way, the mission was successful. Uh, the, uh, naviga the navigation hazard was removed, along with many other things we didn't intend to remove, but we didn't care at that time. Uh, there were 50,000 spectators. Uh, in, in 1885, that's a lot of people uh, on both sides of the river watching this, and they saw about 10 acres of the East River rise up hundreds of feet. And there's some great pictures of that blast uh, that you can take a look at, and I, I encourage you to do that. But, you know, we, we do things a little bit differently now in the 21st century, and that, that's a good thing. You know, and what, why do we do that? Well, we do it because, there's a co because of a combination of heightened environmental awareness, investment in infrastructure. We do it because of passage of environmental laws and regula regulations. We do it because of the efforts of organizations like the MWA environmental advocates and others because there's now a realization that the harbor can be both an environmental engine and an economic resource. The harbor community incorporated that view really into I think our collective vision of what is a world-class harbor estuary. You know I'm very proud that the Corps has played a key positive role in restoring the estuary with the help of many of you here uh, the comprehensive restoration plan was developed and is now forming the blueprint for restoration of the harbor. Since the release of the plan, over 175 acres of wetlands have been created by the end of this year, most of which is, have been restored using another sexy term called dredge material from the 50-foot harbor deepening project that De Deputy Mayor alluded to. We've restored 135 acres in Jamaica Bay 42 acres in Lincoln Park, New Jersey, four acres in the Bronx and Soundview Park, and we're even using sand from our deepening project in Brooklyn to restore Plum Beach in order to protect the Belt Parkway, partnering with New York City from, from literally falling into the ocean. We've also par partnered with the Hudson River Foundation, the Bay Keeper, the Harbor School, many others to advance oyster reef restoration with the construction of five of six pilot projects around the Harbor Estuary. The sixth one, many thanks to New York City's DEP for building that one in Jamaica Bay. So we've had some success, we've got a long way to go, and that's really what you need to take away with this. We have a long way to go. Let me tell you what uh, the challenges are ahead. I'll lay out, there are many of them, I'll lay out a few of them, and these are challenges that all of us face. And, of course, as I said, I will offer some solutions here. Firstly, I want to talk about the serious contamination that remains in the New York, New Jersey Harbor Estuary, coming really from five key spots. The Upper Hudson River, the Gowanus Canal, and Newtown Creek in New York City, and the Passaic and the Hackensack Rivers in New Jersey. Contaminants in each of these water courses include just about everything. PCBs, dioxin, heavy metals, pesticides, VOCs, DDT, sewage. Sewage still remains, depending on what water course you're talking about. So what's the impact? Why do we care? Well, contamination by heavy metals and PCBs, dioxins greatly reduce the biological and recreational value of the estuary, increase human health risks, exist, economic impacts through restrictions of commercially harvested species. There's ecological impacts through
through bioaccumulation through the food chain. Contaminated sediments also increase the cost of maintaining navigation channels by as much as 10 times the added cost of transporting and processing the material. It costs almost $100 per cubic yard to remove dredge material in the New York, New Jersey Harbor. That price is simply unsustainable. Secondly, second issue, solid waste management policy and implementation of dredge material in particular. All states are not created equal. Really, you've got to look at New Jersey and you've got to compare it to New York State. New Jersey's regulations and policies treat dredge material as a unique medium, regardless of what environment it is encountered in. New York State, on the other hand, treats dredge material very differently, depending on where in the regulatory scheme of things you find it. It tends to be very, very restrictive. It's difficult to deal with dredge material and dredge material placement in New York State, which contributes to the unsustainability of our navigation interests and, in some cases, our restoration interests in the harbor estuary. However, I'm, I'm very happy to report that New York State will be reestablishing dredge material expertise inside the New York State DEC, which is much needed uh, through cooperation and investment through the Empire State Development Corporation and a group that got together to really work hard to get that expertise back on the staff so we can figure out better ways of dealing with dredge material because it is an asset in New York State. So, so what's the impact? What's the impact of this overly restrictive policy? Well, you know, I mentioned the exorbitant prices that are unsustainable. And I've got to tell you, the real impact could be something called mudlock. Okay, and mudlock is a very dangerous situation with severe economic impacts. And it refers to the fragmentation and dysfunction of regulatory review concerning dredge material over a period of time. And New York has seen it twice. We saw it in the 1980s and we saw it early in the 1990s. In the early 1990s, it really took the intervention of the Vice President of the United States to unlock the mudlock. We certainly don't want to be in that position again. In each case, regulatory improvements resulted from the issue. However, uh, agency attitudes need to change, we think, need to be modified to some degree. You know, and we've got to make sure that we can continue to do the navigation projects and maintenance projects that we need around the harbor estuary because without those, ships can't get in, stuff can't get in and out, and the economy could be severely impacted. And lastly, I want to talk about the challenge of decreasing federal resources for water resource development and management. You heard Roland talk about the horror uh, that he sees when he looks at the direction of federal resources, and that's just a reality. That's not going to change. Okay, we can talk about where, you know, how we compete here in New York and New Jersey for the limited and, and more constrained resources that are going to exist, and we should do that. And I'll talk about that a little bit, but the reality is the direction of funding for water resource development and management is going to go down. So why? Why do we care about that? Well, we care about that because we've got a heck of a restoration challenge here, a remediation challenge I, I, I talked about. We've got, it threatens our regulatory oversight. It threatens economic development. You know, the last thing we want to do is lose this momentum that all of you have worked so hard to create. The last thing we want to do is, is leave a situation of increased vulnerability to those ecosystems that we've gone a long way to try to restore. And the last thing we want to do is stunt our ability to leverage the amazing water resources our nation and our region enjoys. So those are the problems. Okay, so what about solutions? How about a couple of radical ideas about how we can fix this in the current environment we're living in? Well, I will tell you, no matter where you're sitting, whether you're in government, whether you're in industry, 
whether you're in an interest group, you play a key role. And let me tell you what that could be. But I'd like to harness each one of you and turn you into what the Corps of Engineers likes to call a solutioneer. That's what we need, solutioneers uh, working together. The solutions I'd like to discuss are innovation, invention, collaboration, broadening and adapting the authority of agencies, incentivizing the private sector, and streamlining the regulatory process. Firstly, innovation. We absolutely must embrace new technologies, new ideas together to overcome the challenges I've talked about. Let me give you an example of how we're doing that. The vision of the world-class harbor estuary here in New York and New Jersey. We have got to get out of this zero-sum mindset that we're in. And I think we're coming out of it, but we need to continue to come out of this zero-sum mindset and look for ways to enhance the environment, public safety, and uh, the economy simultaneously with all the activities we conduct here in the harbor estuary. That's how you build real sustainability. An example of badly needed invention and innovation, those of you who, are, who like to invest in things and create things out there, how about someone going out and helping us create real large-scale contaminated sediment decontamination technologies that we can use right now? There's billions of dollars to be made in this, billions of dollars. Millions of cubic yards a year come out of this harbor and need to be treated. Right now what we're doing is we're trucking them to places that are willing to take them. That costs a heck of a lot of money and just moves the problem from one place to the other. Okay, we need to do something different. We're making great progress in the upper Hudson River. We're making, uh, we're starting to make progress on the Passaic River with finishing up the 40,000 cubic yards. Uh, of course, there are 11 million cubic yards over there that still need to be treated or taken care of. And, you know, I congratulate the EPA in particular for leading the efforts. You know, I viewed the, the, the uh, PCB removal of the Hudson River project and it's going along quite well, may actually be ahead of schedule. So congratulations there. Of course, again, what we're doing with that stuff is we're moving it out of the area. We've got a long way to go. Some nascent technologies show promise, but nothing to the scale that we need to tackle the problem. We need private investment. We need private investment to make significant headway. There's huge opportunities to set up contaminated, decontamination of, of contaminated dredge material here, right in New York and New Jersey. And we need entrepreneurs and even venture capitalists to take some risk to allow us to do that. Again, billions of dollars to be made. How about collaboration? I'm talking about real partnering here. You know, we use, the, we use the term collaboration a lot, but we really don't know what it means. Let me tell you what it means in my mind. It's where ideas are exchanged and integrated into projects and programs, not ignored. Okay, this is not meeting because you have to meet, because legally you're responsible for meeting with the public and other entities. It means meeting and really having a valuable exchange of idea and coming up with a product that's an integrated product that takes in consideration the interests of all groups that are involved, all stakeholders. Let me give you an example of that happening right now. Dredge material management strategy development. By 2014, right here in New York and New Jersey, the harbor deepening project will be finished. We'll have secured the 270,000 jobs that uh, the shipping industry has, direct and indirect jobs because we will have finished this deepening project, which will allow the largest ships in the world to, to enter and exit through the Panama Canal after its expansion. It's a huge success story. But after that, the onus is going to be on the Corps, the Port Authority, and others to maintain those channels. And that's not going to come cheap. You know, this is 1.5 million cubic yards a year. That's about half the volume of the Empire state building. That's a lot of stuff we've got to handle. So with these costs in mind, the Corps engaged our partners and formed a dredge material strategic planning group capable of reviewing every 
option for managed dredge material. We included all levels of government. We got many volunteers from government to join us, the New York State DEC, the New Jersey DEP, the New Jersey DOT, Empire State Development Corporation, the Port Authority, the EDC, National Marine Fisheries, and the EPA. The Corps also included key non-governmental partners representing a variety of interests. Clean Ocean Action, Baykeeper, we've got the Hudson River Foundation as part of this effort. We've got the New York Shipping Association part of this effort. Again, inclusive, creating forums to exchange and integrate ideas. The Corps acts as a facilitator, but we're happy to report that the states are going to take the lead in implementing the recommendations of this group to avoid the mudlock, to make sure that we can continue to drive economic development and success here in New York and New Jersey. The plan uh, will come up with recommendations that will be released this year, and God willing, we'll be in good shape to avoid that as the deepening Comes, project comes to an end. We're not saying that additional funding is not going to be necessary, but we've got to reduce the amount of funding that's necessary to maintain those channels in light of the general trend to reduce federal funding that I talked about earlier on. Another su successful collaboration example is the development of the Comprehensive Restoration Plan. Over 100 different organizations were involved in the development of that plan. And we're proud of that, okay? We not, not only being the core, but being every one of those organizations. That group is proud of that, that project development team. Okay, we're, we created a plan that's based on science, not politics, okay? Not wishful thinking, but science. That's a great, we think that's a great basis for any plan that needs to be successful in the future. And that plan is now the consensus vision for restoration in the estuary. That's the master plan, and we're proud that New York City, New York State, State of New Jersey, and others have integrated into their strategic plans uh, in order to have a combined integrated effort. And that plan now includes 300 restoration opportunities across the harbor estuary. But we need to continue collaboration to implement that plan. With current and future limited federal funding, we must think strategically and incentivize the private sector to advance the restoration goals. How about this? Every project that wants to advance on the waterfront should incorporate as much restoration and ecological features as possible in the original design. I realize that costs a little bit of extra money, but that's the right-headed way to proceed. This will help Greek grease the skids for the leg regulatory process, as well as help achieve both restoration goals and economic development goals. Again, kudos to New York City Planning and the MWA and others for pushing this concept through workshops, task forces, and guidance that's been put out. The next solution is broadening and adapting the authority set at federal and state level. How about we establish programmatic authorities to do what's best for watersheds, coast sheds, estuaries, taking a holistic approach, using a common set of objectives and inclusive government structures, governance structures. We need to add flexibility to our cost-sharing authorities. Every, every, re every project that the Corps investments, almost every, requires a local cost-sharing partner. Those are usually government entities. How about we, we do more public-private partnerships? What happens if a wealthy philanthropist wants to restore wetlands in Jamaica Bay or along the Hudson River? Right now it's very difficult for the Corps to participate. We think that's wrong. We need to find ways. We need to pass legislation that allows things like that to happen more easily so those limited federal resources can be spread out to do the optimum amount of good for our harbor estuary. How about we cr create a restoration trust fund? Okay, this is one that I stole from Venetia Lannan. I don't know if she's here. But, you know, I like to steal ideas shamelessly if they're good ideas. 
you know, this fund would pool contributed private resources to be combined with public resources to maximize restoration undertaken in the era of reduced federal investment. This trust would be managed by an intergovernmental steering committee with input from citizen advocacy groups that prioritizes the use of those funds, a restoration trust fund, another good idea that needs to be discussed a little bit more. Given the need for tremendous resources to achieve these restoration goals, it couldn't be better timing that the Harbor Coalition has sprung into action. Okay? Consistent messaging about our region's priorities cannot be stressed enough. We need the right voice, the single voice in Washington to speak and advocate for the resources that this national water resource or resource of national significance needs. And the Harbor Coalition is the right voice to do that. So if you're not part of that Harbor Coalition, become part of it and make sure your voice is heard. And lastly, we need streamlined regulatory processes. I, I don't think I'm going to get much disagreement from anyone here. For example, the Corps uses nationwide permits and regional permits, regional general permits, to manage our regulatory responsibilities. We want to minimize the use of individual permit actions which take time and generally are not needed for most actions. We try to use the most efficient permit process for activities that do not cause more than minimal individual and cumulative adverse effects on the aquatic resource. Over 85% of our permit decisions are made in 60 days or less. We need to do better, but we're proud of the direction that the Corps headed. And we're always looking for ways to improve on that. And I think if you do have a permit action with the Corps, you find in most cases, should be in all cases, that we're willing to work with you to establish your project in a way that does not impede the integrity and the importance of the integrity of what that Clean Water Act needs to stand for. For the other regulatory agencies in the room, we need to be open-minded. All of us need to be more open-minded. We need, we need to enhance predictability, okay? We need to enhance predictability among our permit applicants. We have to think big, holistically, less at the project level about the impact of that project, that little project, and more holistically at the comprehensive level about what are the needs and impacts on the estuary, the coast shed, the watershed as a whole as we look at approval of that permit. That's absolutely critical. We've got to open up our lenses, take much less of a narrow point of view, much more of a wider perspective to really start to make progress of the scale that's absolutely necessary. We must continue to work together to overcome the legacy policy constraints that stand in our way. So in conclusion, I'm about finished, that's good news. We made plenty of progress in the last 40 years since the Clean Water Act was passed. Protecting, remediating, enhancing the environment, we got a long way to go though. Challenges of reduced government spending, overly constrained regulatory process, management, legacy contamination on our water courses and aquatic ecosystem. The way we sustain momentum, I say again, and maybe even accelerate our efforts is to find common ground as we've done in the past 10 or 20 years. We need to exchange ideas, optimize, optimize use of public-private partnerships and resources, work with Congress and our legislators to modify and create authorities for our public agencies to do programmatic, holistic work, find ways to incentivize innovation and invention across our harbor estuary and motivate technical innovation. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. If you can stand for just a minute. Uh, <clears throat> uh, thank you very much, uh, Colonel Boulay. I'm John Watts. I have the privilege of uh, being 
uh, board member and chair of um, MWA and have the <clears throat> enjoyable job of trying to control Roland and others. I want to uh, particularly uh, uh, notice that we have with us uh, Kent Barwick, who is uh, Roland's predecessor and really the founder of this organization. But uh, with that wonderful talk by Colonel Boulay, I wanted to remind us of a couple of things having to do with MWA. One of them is that in our 12 years of having this conference, and by the way, we expect about 680 people to take part, which is about two and a half times the first one. But in each of our conferences and in a couple of other occasions a year, we have uh, recognized people who have made a real contribution to what we're trying to do to improve this harbor uh, for er all the reasons that we've been talking about. And I am very pleased to announce that we have two winners of that award, which we call the Hero of the Harbor. And you've just heard from one of them, Colonel Boulay. Not only... <laughs> <I'm> <clears throat> He's, he mentioned many, many of the things that, uh, that he has done as the leader, the strong leadership in this four, almost four-year period. And, but the one I'd like to just give you as an example is in Gateway or Jamaica Bay, which is our largest, I believe, park in this area and certainly one of the largest water-related parks uh, in the country. The environmental rest restoration project there has been done with such vigor and efficiency that it is probably one of the largest ones in the world and certainly the largest water park restoration project in the United States. And that's been under Colonel Boulay's leadership. So I want to in include him and in the over two dozen people who've received a Hero of the Harbor Award. <clears throat> Which is <clears throat> this nice little <laughs> lifesaver. Thank you very much. Um, <clears throat> Be <Pete> Navy. <laughs> hey there. <laughs> we can talk later about that. Uh, <clears throat> I have had the opportunity, um, actually, by 15 years uh, in the regular U.S. Navy, I got carted around to a lot of harbors of the world, and I want to tell you just a little bit about that in a minute. But I also want to point out that we have a second a recipient of the Hero of the Harbor Award, <clears throat> who is the uh, commander of the Coast Guard here, uh, Rear Admiral Linda Fagan, who was supposed to be with us but got ordered to, to go somewhere else. And uh, we have uh, for her, uh, to receive for her, uh, <clears throat> the uh, uh, commander uh, that is number two here, who, uh, where is, Ms. Burgess, Mer Ms. Burgess. Commander Burgess has had a, a distinguished career. Uh, I, I won't list the different places she's been, but it's been all over the country. And I want to thank the Coast Guard for also being way above the call of duty in the uh, collaboration mentioned by Colonel Boulay in the encouragement and in the doing their part of the job with an extra uh, emphasis and extra efficiency. So would you give this a, 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 a thank you very much. <clears throat> thank you. Can, can you say a, a, yes, a quick public service announcement? No, uh, first of all, for Colonel Boulay, you were our number one choice for the dining out, sir, just so you know. And, uh, no, um, uh, this is actually presented for Rear Admiral Melinda Fagan. Um, she sends her regret she's not here. She's currently uh, get um, her trial by uh, fire hose indoctrination at the at the U.S. Northern Command. Uh, for those of you who wonder what a Coast Guard officer is doing at the U.S. Northern Command, um, she'll always say she's not tracking Santa Claus. Um, but she, uh, what she's doing is an interagency uh, assignment with the Department of Defense and other key government agencies to look after the better half of our, our northern northern hemisphere. So, uh, so she's uh, going to a very important job. She wishes she could be here. Um, and really on her behalf, uh, knowing what she's doing right now, she'd much rather have been underway earlier this morning. 
Uh, the new captain of the port will be coming in on the 13th of June, and that's uh, Captain Gordon Lobel. Uh, he started out here in New York uh, in the late 80s, so he might be a familiar face to some, and he's excited about the new assignment, so no doubt he'll be here most likely for City Water Day, so you'll see a new familiar Coast Guard face. So on behalf of Admiral Fagan, thank you very much. <clears throat> uh, thank you, Commander Sturgis. I, we're running a bit behind. I, I want to uh, uh, cut short my own remarks, but I do want to point out that we have four missions in MWA. And by the way, if any of you are not individual members, please sign up. Uh, and those four missions, one of them is what we're doing today, convene folks. The other thing is to support the organizations that are working uh, to improve the harbor for recreation and fishing and uh, jobs and commerce. And those organizations now today, uh, it's kind of amazing, the members of MWA, the Alliance, our last name is Alliance, uh, there are now 644 of those, which is pretty amazing. So I give, again, uh, our, our dedicated staff I think we say thank you for doing that job, and we're trying to do a good job of advocating for those 644 organizations. That's an organization for every mile of New York water front. So thanks again. So we support organizations, we convene, and then where there is either an absence or a need for an extra push, we try to actually do things directly, and the two other things that we're working particularly hard on now are recreation and access, access in the form of community docks, recreation in the form of just really beginning to get our hands around the opportunities uh, of, this, uh, of this great harbor. So we hope that you'll join us. We hope you'll have a great time in this uh, conference, and we look forward to getting back on schedule. So.